Do you have sciatic nerve pain? Very often it starts up here in your lower back or in your butt and then it radiates down your leg. It might go down behind your knee. Sometimes it can even go all the way down your leg, all the way to your foot. If you have sciatica, if you've tried a bunch of different exercises, if you're worried that it's not getting better, in fact, maybe it's getting worse, this video is for you. Hey, my name is Lucas, I'm a yoga teacher, and I used to have really bad sciatica myself, and along my healing journey, I learned a bunch of things that hopefully will be helpful for you. In this video, we'll talk about the anatomy of the sciatic nerve, We'll chat about what goes wrong, why it happens, and most importantly, some things you can do to accelerate the healing process. Quick disclaimer here. If you've got a major back pain issue, if you've got a major sciatica issue where you're not able to control your bowels or your bladder, please go see a doctor. I'm a yoga teacher. This is for educational purposes only based on my experience. Hopefully, it's helpful for you. I'll start off by sharing with you my story. I went to a meditation retreat. It was a Vipassana 10-day silent retreat and they had us sitting on the floor for 12 hours a day, no exaggeration. I went from zero meditation to 12 hours a day seated on the floor. It was an amazing experience, but at the end of the retreat, as I was leaving the retreat center, I noticed my right leg felt kind of weird. And by weird, I mean it was numb, it was tingly, and it was really, really weak. What that looked like is I could not stand on one leg in a tree pose. I'm a yoga teacher, that's a big problem. I need to stand on one leg pretty much every day. So I was really freaked out. I was worried, did I do some kind of nerve damage where I'm never gonna be able to use my leg balancing again? And so I freaked out, I started learning a lot. I realized I'd done some injury that is, was infl inflaming my sciatic nerve, better known as sciatica, and I learned a bunch of things that'll hopefully be helpful for you. Let's start off by looking at the anatomy of your sciatic nerve. Sciatic nerve is the longest nerve in your body. It runs all along, it starts at your lumbar spine, runs all along the backside of your leg, all the way down to your foot. It's also the thickest nerve in your body. At some places, it can be as much as 1.5 to 2 millimeters thick, so it's a big, thick cable running down the back of your leg. Here's the important thing to remember. It starts up here in your lumbar spine, at lumbar vertebrae four and five, and also in your sacral vertebrae, one, two, and three. There's actually five nerve roots that correspond with those vertebrae. They come out and they're wrapped in a sheath that then runs along the backside of your leg. They innervate your hamstrings, your sciatic nerve. It then bifurcates and splits off. It kind of tree branches down into your lower leg and it innervates most of the muscles of your lower leg as well. What does all that mean? It means we've got a big giant nerve along the backside of your body. And when there are problems, and the problem is usually called sciatica, it often originates from here in your lower back. In fact, about 90% of the time, that problem does originate for your lower back. So for the sake of this video, we're gonna focus on lumbar disc problems related to sciatica. Just as a side note, there are other causes of sciatica. For example, piriformis syndrome, not so common, but it does happen, and other muscular contractions that can impinge upon the nerve. We'll cover those in future videos. For today, I'll assume that if you have sciatica today, like 90% of the people who have sciatica, like me when I had sciatica, it's coming from this lumbar region. What happens down here in our lumbar spine? Well, we have those five nerve roots coming out in between our vertebrae. And here's the thing about those nerve roots. They can become impinged, which basically just means pushed upon, triggered, inflamed, very often when we have disc problems. What could be the problem? We could have a compression or degradation of the disc. We could also have some kind of injury from jumping or very often from lifting something that's heavy. What happens? Where our intervertebral discs, they can get compressed and very often will have a bulge or even a herniation and it often happens posteriorly. Let me show you on a different model here. In between each of our vertebrae, we have these discs. The analogy people often use is like a jelly donut. That's not a very good analogy because a jelly donut, you can squish like this. Your intervertebral discs are way more resilient than that. They are really amazing shock absorbers and there are two main parts to your intervertebral disc. The outer part is called your annulus fibrosis and you can think of this like white leather strips wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. It's very, very strong. Now the inner part, that is more squishy. That is your nucleus pulposus. 
And this part is usually the part that is moving around when we have a bulge or a herniation. And again, that's usually the source of the pain for sciatica. What happens during a bulge or a herniation? Well, maybe I'm lifting something heavy and I have some compression and that nucleus starts to push out. That would be a bulge. It attempts to push out, but it doesn't fully push out. It's bulging disc. A little bit more severe would be a herniated disc, and that's where the nucleus successfully breaks through that annulus fibrosis. And now we have that squishy nucleus impinging upon, pushing upon that sciatic nerve root. And that's going to create that radiating nerve pain known as sciatica. When you see this, this looks horrible, and you think, oh no, I have a herniated disc. This is what my doctors told me. I have sciatica. My spine is never going to heal. I'm going to have to live with this broken spine for the rest of my life. Not true. Bulging discs, extremely common. Herniated discs, fairly common. And here's the good news. The majority of the people within four to eight weeks will heal. Things will resolve. Things will go back to normal or at least normal-ish. So that's the good news. Your body has a tremendous healing capacity. Here's how it works. You're lifting something heavy. <clears throat> you get this herniation. Let's say it's worst case scenario. Your annulus fibrosis is impinging upon that nerve. Here's what happens. Your body immediately sends out proteins, cytokines, these inflammatory markers, and you create inflammation. Oh no, inflammation is bad. No, it's not. These cytokines attract something called macrophages. Think of macrophages sort of like um, piranhas. They go in and they clean up. They're, they're a type of white blood cell, and they go up and they start cleaning up all of this debris, all of this damaged tissue. Over time, a couple of important things happen. Number one, that nucleus that has herniated, it's going to dehydrate once it's broken through that annulus fibrosis. So if you imagine this like a raisin, it'll start to shrivel up. This is good news because then it will stop impinging upon that nerve root. Second thing that's going to happen is these macrophages are going to come in and do their job and clean things up. And eventually this will gristle very likely into a fully functioning, slightly damaged, but fully functional intervertebral disc. Okay, so why don't we just wait around and let that happen? Well, you could, but a much better approach is instead of just waiting around, we can accelerate the healing process and hopefully we can have less pain as we go. That's really our goal here is to assist our body in the healing process. And the first thing to think about is that inflammation. Remember that inflammation and that macrophage process, these are natural adaptive healing processes and you don't want to impede them unless it's necessary. Putting ice will reduce the inflammation, will slow down the healing process. Taking ibuprofen, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that will again reduce the inflammation, reduce the pain. That's good for sleeping, but not good for healing. For sure, follow your doctor's orders, and if you can't sleep at night, that's a different thing. But assuming you can manage, let your body do its thing, let that inflammation, let those macrophages come in and do their work and clean up, that's step number one. Uh, the next thing we want to do is move to heal. There's been a whole bunch of studies. Is it better just to lie flat on the bed and wait for everything to go away, or is it better to move around? And undoubtedly, the overwhelming mountain of research says we need to move to heal. When we move, it helps with circulation. It helps to get things moving, especially in these tissues, which don't necessarily have the best circulation. It also helps you to heal in a functional manner. What that means is you might lie on the bed, and within two weeks, the pain is gone. But the moment you get up and move, the pain comes back. We need to teach our body how we want to move so we heal up in a functional matter. How do we do that? A couple of important things. First thing is we need to regress our movements. Remember that sciatica is very similar to a headache. Let's imagine you woke up this morning and you had a headache. Well, is the headache the problem? Well, the headache's a terrible problem, but that's not the source of the problem. The source of the problem is maybe you're dehydrated. The source of the problem is maybe you drank too much last night. Or the source of the problem could be a brain tumor, right? With sciatica, it's the same thing. Very often to find the source of the problem, we need to go upstream. 90% of the time, the problem is your lumbar spine, specifically your intervertebral disc, L4, L5, S1. So to fix the sciatica, we need to go upstream. But we need to remember that we don't just have a lower back problem. We have a lower back plus an impinged nerve problem. So we're going to be extra careful. And we're going to treat this very seriously and we're going to do baby steps quite literally as we go. Regressive movements means instead of running, we're going to walk. In addition to walking, we're going to crawl. In addition to crawling, we're going to stabilize. If you think about the way a child learns to move, learns locomotion, 
They're lying on the changing table. They roll around. They, from there, they start to crawl. From there, they walk and wobble. And they walk very similar to me when I left that meditation center. A little bit like this, right? My legs didn't work that well. When we're reestablishing strength and balance and mobility of a damaged area, it's very, very helpful to regress our movements. Number one thing I want you to do is walk. And I know you're thinking, I just watched this video and he's telling me to walk. But yes, if you look at the clinical research, exercise, physiology, healing, published literature, whatever you look at, the research around walking is overwhelmingly positive for all types of back problems. But please walk pain-free. This isn't hill climbing. This isn't hiking. This isn't sprinting upstairs. This is walking on flat surfaces, one kilometer per day pain-free to start. Eventually, you can up that to two or even three kilometers. Start walking every day. The next thing we need to do is get down on the floor and move like a child, regress our movements as we learn to reestablish strength and mobility. Let's move down to the floor and we'll go from here. The first pose we'll look at is a crawling position. This crawl is designed to build strength around our spine to support that lumbar spine region and help us relieve that pressure on our sciatic nerve. Please only do this if you don't feel pain. If you start to feel pain, back off to a place where you don't and work in that range. This idea of no pain, no gain has no space here when we're dealing with your sciatica condition. We start off on all fours like a child crawling, but tuck your toes under. My knees are under my hips, my hands are under my shoulders. Option number one is keep your knees on the floor. You might wanna do this on a soft surface and we'll take five crawls forward and five crawls back. It looks like this. Right hand, left knee, one, two, I'm alternating, three, four, five, and then backwards, five, four, three, two, and one. The next option is with your knees up. This is significantly more challenging. Spread your fingers under your shoulders. Again, pain-free is what we're looking for. Your knees are under your hips. Lift your knees just above the floor, keep your hips low. And now we crawl one, two, three, four, five, and then back five, four, three, two, and one. One of the most challenging thing about these exercises, I've already asked you to go walking, now I'm telling you to crawl. So they're very, very basic. Remember we have a window of healing here. It's not that long. I know it feels like forever, but if you're careful, if you're mindful, you can really accelerate the healing, you'll be happy it did. You can do up to 10 rounds of these crawls every day. The next one we'll take a look at is called a pointer pose. This is a classic stabilization pose. It's an isometric pose, meaning we'll stick the pose and hold it, and we'll hold it for a total of one minute. Hands and knees like a child crawling. My toes are tucked just like before. Keep your neck long, so gaze out in front of you on the floor. I'll start my timer, lift my left leg back, point your toe, lift my right arm forward, hand faces towards the inside. Don't take your leg way up high, instead keep it right about at the height of your bum. Gaze in front of you and breathe in and out through your nose. Good, release your hand down, sit back. You can shake out your hands just for a moment and we'll switch sides. These are called pointer pose. will help you to develop that dynamic core strength to support your lower back, but in a very, very cautious way, static poses, isometric poses are always a safer entry point back into strength. Let's do the other side. We're on our hands and knees like a child crawling. I'll hit my timer for one minute. This time my right leg goes back, zoom, straight back behind me with my toe pointed. My left arm goes out in front, hand faces towards the inside, my neck stays long, and I'll breathe in and out through my nose here.
Good, and slowly lower down, sit back on your heels. And we'll shake it out with our arms. So you're walking, you're crawling, we're doing these strengthening poses. The next pose is a twist. We're working on some axial rotation, but we're also going to twist in our lower back region. We'll do this one on our back. So lower down on your back, lift your right leg into the air with your knee bent. We'll hold here in this twist for one minute. With my right leg bent, I'll hook my right foot behind my left knee like this. My left hand goes on top of my knee. So left arm, right leg, and I'll push my knee over to the side with my right arm extended like a T position. Here's the key thing. Only go as far as you can with no pain. If you feel pain, back off a little bit. If you don't feel pain, keep going, keep going. With your gaze, keep your eyes looking up towards the ceiling, pressing your knee down toward the floor. Your breath comes in and out through your nose. Your hip will, of course, lift up off the ground. Your shoulders will be a little bit up off the ground. That's okay. Just keep that gentle press onto your knee. Good, slowly back up to center. You probably can guess where we're going here. We'll do the other side. My left knee bends. I'll hook my left foot on the back of my right knee. Take my right hand and I'll put it on top of my knee, gently pressing, gently pressing my knee towards the floor. Extend your left arm out. Remember, only go to where you feel comfortable. If you feel pain, back off and work there. If you're okay, you can continue to press your leg, your hip will roll up, that's okay. Your shoulders will probably roll up, that's okay. Breathing here. Good, and release your leg all the way back up to center. And we'll do one more pose, which is a down dog variation, but we'll use a chair or a countertop. I'll be using a high chair, but it might work better for you to use like a kitchen countertop. Let me get my chair now. This next pose we'll do is called an up dog, down dog flow, but I'll be using a chair. Might be easier for you to use a high kitchen counter. We're deliberately making these poses a lot more accessible, a lot more gentle, so we can keep our spine in a more neutral range. At the same time, we'll work on gentle spinal extension, back bend, and very gentle spinal flexion, forward bend. Let me show you how it works. Stand about a meter away from your countertop. Place your hands on your countertop or your chair. I'll lift my chest forward and come up on the tippy toes and I'll lift to an upward facing dog for five, four, my shoulders away from my ears, three, two, just a gentle back bend, one, and now I'll press back, heels down, bend your knees and shoot your bum backwards and hold here, five, four, three, two, one, forward with your chest, forward with your chin, Lift up on your tippy toes and we'll hold here. Five, shoulders go down your back, away from your ears. Four, three, two, one. Press your bum back, your heels down. Extend your arms and have your ears and your arms in one line. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's try one more time. Your chest comes forward, 
pressing your arms straight, lift up on your tippy toes, lengthening, look up where the wall meets the ceiling. We're here five, four, three, two, and one. Press your hips back, knees are bent, heels are down, extra gentle here. Five, four, three, two, one. Release slowly all the way back up and shake your arms out. Okay, so here's what we chatted about today. Sciatica is usually a canary in a coal mine. It's usually indicative of a lumbar spine disc problem. We know that we need to be very, very careful. We know that we want to regress movements. Instead of running or hiking or climbing stairs, we're gonna start walking one kilometer per day to start off with. Next, we're gonna regress our movements all the way down to the floor. We'll start off with some basic crawls, some isometric holds, some basic twists. And lastly, we looked at some supported up dog, down dog variations. If you include these exercises into your daily routine, you can do them all together, or lots of my students like to break them up throughout the day, it can be a really, really helpful way to keep things moving. Remember that you're looking at a four to eight week healing journey here usually. Your objective is to help your body, help itself, relieve pain and heal up strong, just like before. One other thought, as we mentioned before, really helpful if you can reduce the amount of anti-inflammatory drugs that you're taking, ibuprofen specifically. Also helpful if you can boost your omega-3s. Things like fish oil, krill oil, or algae oil can be really helpful. They're anti-inflammatory, but their mechanisms of action are different than anti-inflammatory drugs, and they will help you to heal more quickly. I'd recommend about one gram per day if you're taking a supplement. With all of these exercises, it's really important to remember that your pain should either stay the same or get better. If you're waking up the next day and you're feeling worse, you're doing it wrong. Many people think that it needs to get worse before it gets better. That doesn't make any sense when we're talking about sciatica. It should either stay the same or get better or you're pushing too far. Hope you found this video helpful. If you'd like more science-based yoga videos, hit subscribe down below. Really appreciate if you hit like, and if you have questions, I answer all my questions down below in the comments. You can find my teaching schedule at yogabody.com. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I hope to see you in the next one.